I'm mainly uh, speaking to the lead essay in this year's Socialist Register, uh, which is called A World Turned Upside Down, question uh, mark. And the lead essay, which I wrote with Sam Gindon, is called Trumping the Empire. Uh, and it's an attempt uh, to come to figure out uh, in the wake of the book on the making of global capitalism that Sam and I published uh, some five, six years ago, uh, what the significance of uh, Trump's election, uh, the hyper-nationalism, the xenophobia uh, that he represents, but not he alone represents, means in terms of the continuation of global capitalism. These people are hardly uh, globalists in the sense of people who were promoting globalization like Clinton and Blair, et cetera, et cetera. So we, we tried to work out uh, where this came from, what are the contradictions that produced it, and what are the possible long-term effects of it. There's been a long-standing misinterpretation of the problems besetting the United States place in the world in terms of challenges to its imperial dominance coming from the outside, from rivals to its economic and political dominance. This is, of course, a common trope on the right, make America great again was a Reagan phrase, uh, although Trump obviously made running with it. Uh, make Britain great again was a Thatcher phrase. I happened, luckily, to live in a country where if a politician said, make Canada great again, they'd be laughed off the political stage. <laughs> and that's one of the great things about living there. But there's a mirror image version of this on the left uh, that goes back to the old notion of interimperial rivalry as the explanation of the, the uh, breakup and decline of the imperial regimes from the late 19th century up to World War I. Uh, and and uh, the interpretation of the contradictions of the American empire that one very commonly uh, has heard on the left, in some ways going back to the 1940s, has been that there's a resurgence of inter-imperial rivalry. That just as Britain was displaced by an upcoming Germany, or challenge from an upcoming Germany, uh, the United States would be replaced. And one heard this from Kolko, from Gabriel Kolko, in 1948, uh, if you go back and read some of his uh, early writings. Especially by the 1960s, with the emergence of the dollar crisis, a very common trope became uh, that uh, the Europeans were had recovered with the aid of of course, Marshall Plan, help, et cetera, recovered to the point that they were challenging American dominance. In fact, uh, what was taking place and what had caused the dollar crisis was the deeper integration of the European states into the informal American empire. That is, the enormous foreign direct investment that flowed from multinational corporations, only beginning in 1958-59, once European wages had reached a Fordist stage that could support the uh, realization of profits by MNCs by producing right inside Europe, there was an enormous outflow of capital, of private capital, from the United States, and it was accompanied by Wall Street banks moving to Europe as well. There was the beginning of the Euro-dollar market in London, lending often to American MNCs uh, uh, additional capital to what they were taking out of the United States. The dollar crisis, therefore, was not primarily a crisis of trade, of uh, a crisis of the trade account. It was a crisis of the flow of the capital account, where European capitalism had recovered, but had not established the deep capital markets to uh, sustain the high degree of capital accumulation that was taking place in Europe from the 60s on. There was an increasing integration and, you know, by the mid-1960s, uh, 
French sociologists like Raman Aron were speaking of the Canadianization of Europe, uh, by which they meant the penetration of American capital as a social force inside Europe. And that was the root of the dollar crisis. Uh, uh, and, and the attempt, finally, the introduction of capital controls by the United States in 1968 to stem that flow. Right. Famously by, of course, with Bretton Woods, uh, people were predicting the end of the dollar, the end of the dollar's dominance. Uh, on the contrary, uh, uh, partly by virtue of the solution of the internal problems that were contributing to the dollar crisis. Here's where I will mention the working class. Uh, the great degree of industrial militancy in the 1960s and early 1970s, which was having the effect of squeezing profits. Uh, the ability of cor corporations were, of course, raising prices. That was the source of the inflation before the great oil crisis, which after 73 increased it all the more. But they could only raise them so much given the competition that was taking place from Germany and Japan. And indeed, the investment by German and Japanese multinationals inside the United States by the late 1960s. Uh, the auto industry competing with American uh, dominance at home in the auto market, etc. cetera. Um, so was, the dollar was, uh, if you like, its dominance was preserved by the breaking of that industrial militancy. Uh, it happened slowly through the course of the 70s, but it was, of course, the great Volcker shock, 18% interest rates breaking the back of trade union militancy and coming with the defeat of trade unionism by the early 80s. In the 1980s, Make America Great Again was heard from Reagan in terms that sounded very much like Trump initially with indeed the introduction of steel tariffs for a period, and Japan was then seen as the primary challenger to American dominance. And again, uh, uh, you saw a explanation adopted by significant parts of the left as well uh, of a new type of inter-imperial rivalry. In the early 2000s, you saw that now coming from China. Uh, China was uh, the growing uh, late capitalist developer, uh, which uh, was serving in the early 21st century the role that Germany had played vis-a-vis -vis British uh, hegemony uh, in the early 20th century. Uh, this was overlaid uh, by the emergence of the euro. So the expectation through the early years of the first decade of the 21st century, insofar as the left is always predicting 49 of the last one, one or two crises. That's what the left does. They were mostly predicting uh, the next capitalist crisis as coming from either the Chinese or Japanese pulling out of their purchase of American treasury bills, which is that sustains the dominance of the dollar around the world, or the euro displacing the dollar as the primary global currency. Of course, the 2008 crisis did not happen because of external challenges. On the contrary, it happened because of internal contradictions inside American capitalism. And those contradictions uh, reflected in part the fact that with the breaking of trade unions, working class people were living on credit, not only consumer credit, uh, but on mortgage credit. Uh, whether in the form of uh, investing in houses with, in, or to, in order to see the accumulation of real estate prices being their main guarantee of any wealth, or in fact living from day to day by taking out second mortgages. Uh, Clinton very proudly, the Clinton Treasury, uh, pointed to the secondary market in, in, in mortgages, the subprime mortgages, as uh, one of the great evidences that Clinton was the great black president because he was providing home ownership to the American black population uh, through supporting the secondary mortgage market. But again, this was also a reflection of internationalization. David Harvey has shown, for those of you who are anthropologists, uh, that the largest holder of subprime mortgages in the black residential areas of Cleveland was Deutsche Bank. 
uh, and there, there was an enormous integration of European banking into the American mortgage market. Uh, it went all the way down to the semi-public regional banks of Germany, the Landesbanken, uh, who indeed were being pressured by the EU uh, to stop uh, concentrating their profit-making activities entirely on um, low interest bearing loans to German industry, which the EU saw as uncompetitive, demanding they secure a higher rate of return, and they did so by investing in the American subprime mortgage market. But it was a contradiction that was generated by the further integration of foreign capital into an American led global capitalism and into Ameri the American economy. Uh, and it was a crisis generated by the contradictions in the American economy, right? not by virtue of a challenge from the outside. And although there was, when the crisis hit, this Made in America crisis, the fourth great crisis in capitalism's history of a global kind, uh, the one of the late 19th century from 1873 to 96, the Great Depression, the crisis of the 70s, the stagflation crisis of the 70s, and then this great financial crisis of 2008, 2007, 8, because it really begins in August 2007. Um, there was enormous schadenfreude in Europe that the Americans were getting their comeuppance. Uh, it was, in fact, uh, uh, American-style capitalism uh, that was being brought down by virtue of this crisis. Very quickly, it was as plain as uh, the eyes on anyone's face or the nose on anyone's face, uh, that Europe would, uh, could not possibly uh, decouple itself from this crisis, not least because of uh, the uh, deep involvement of its banking system uh, in the American capital market and mortgage market above all. I won't talk much about this crisis, but uh, it resolves itself, finally, in the form of a political crisis. It takes 10 years, much like the Great Depression, for the crisis of 2008 to play itself out economically. The United States begins recovering by 2010-11. No sooner does it than the Euro crisis begins. And uh, as the Euro crisis begins to play itself out, the commodity crisis begins in 2013-2014. Uh, uh, and, and you don't get synchronized growth again at a global level until late 2017, early 2018. But by that point, the economic crisis has mutated into a political crisis of global capitalism, largely taking the form of the rise of a xenophobic nationalist political right. Uh, and you know, one doesn't have to go through uh, where it, it is taking place in Central Europe, uh, but obviously, in 2016, the Brexit referendum represents this in spades, and then Trump's election represents it in spades. A political scoundrel who doesn't believe in anything, uh, who is smart enough to see that xenophobia and a baseball cap that says, make America great at it again, with the implication that the problem is American decline in the face of these capitalist challengers from abroad. Uh, overlaid by uh, the contradictions of global migration and the global refugee crisis, uh, which is a crucial element, of course, uh, al alongside the ecological crisis, in making this 2007-2008 financial crisis so enormously complicated and uh, difficult to resolve. Uh, because it is uh, not simply an economic crisis, but because it has these overlapping dimensions with the climate crisis and the Great Migration Crisis. How can it be that states that allegedly have been bypassed by global capitalism, according to the theorists of globalization, 
uh, so weakened by global capitalism, should return in this fashion as the central players in the unmaking of globalization. And of course, this goes back to my early work almost 25 years ago now on what was wrong about globalization theory, a misunderstanding of the role of states in the making of global capitalism. States were not the victims of globalization, they were its authors. Uh, it's not multinational corporations and international banks that sign free trade agreements. It's states that do. But they, insofar as states were central to the making of global capitalism, that in themselves, opening themselves up to the free flow of capital and free trade as far as possible and signing international treaties to that effect, with constitutional effect inside their countries. Uh, they pledge to treat foreign capital the same as domestic capital. That's the central principle of globalization. Uh, and states were uh, trying to secure uh, what they get out of capitalism by doing this. What's, why are states capitalists? It's not because capitalists tell them what to do. It's because they are dependent on capital accumulation for their own legitimation right? and for their own tax base, for their own resources. That's fundamentally what makes a state a capitalist state. Of course, in different times and different periods, there will be less or greater relative autonomy from the pressures from capitalist classes. But the fundamental reasons are those. Uh, and, and states opted for globalization in order to secure the benefits of, above all, the free movement of capital. What came with it, of course, were the contradictions of that. 92 financial crises, as capital controls were removed through the 80s and, and 1990s. Now, there are states and states. The American state, of course, was the leading agent in this. Okay. Superintending and overseeing the adhesion of the rest of the states in the world to this, encouraging them uh, uh, American best practices in terms of the treatment of transnational capital around the world was what uh, most states and the IMF and the World Bank adopted. In order to, because it was states doing this and states didn't go away and insofar as their populations, of course, continue to define themselves as Germans or Americans or Austrians or Canadians, uh, the opening up to global capitalism was always defended as being in the national interest. So j even during the course of the dynamic growth of global capitalism uh, over the last 30 years, over the last three decades and more, that didn't undermine the national identity of states. On the contrary, they reproduced their national identity through authoring globalization and insisting that this was good for the reproduction of that given society. This was in the national interest. Especially, of course, the United States did this. Uh, and there was always this inherent contradiction in the making of global capitalism, visible in every state, but especially visible in, in this state, whereby you could see contradictions inside the state itself over these practices. During the peso crisis of 1994, when the American Treasury, in order to bail out Wall Street, had to bail out the Mexican bonds, it was the Democrats in Congress that the American Treasury, uh, uh, under Rubin, had to conceal the lending of money to the Mexican banks, because they wouldn't have facilitated the use of Treasury funds, uh, and they indeed might have withdrawn funding from the IMF, had they known, that this very secret funding of Mexican banks uh, and the Mexican bond market was taking place. It was then the Democrats in Congress who were the greatest problem. In the 2008 crisis, and we can play this again through the 97-98 Asian crisis, where the American state's role in being the firefighter 
in containing these financial crises from becoming the big one was often concealed from Congress and from the American people. In the 2007-8 crisis as well, the uh, uh, transfers that the Federal Reserve was doing from 2007 on to European banks and even to the Bank of China Limited was concealed from Congress as well as from the American people. So the American state's role as the manager and superintender, the firefighter of the crises as well of global capitalism, was always something that was inside the American state difficult to manage. Uh, and because of the contradictions of the way globalization was experienced inside the United States, it was perhaps only a matter of time before a political scoundrel like Trump or some equal thereof uh, uh, would take advantage of this. I mean, there were small anti-trade elements you could see all going all the way back to the opposition to NAFTA on part of the right as well as on part of the unions. Uh, but of course came to a head uh, with Trump bringing these internal contradictions to the fore. What he was capturing uh, was the fear and unhappiness that American workers had about NAFTA in 1992. People forget that the country that was most difficult to get NAFTA through, the state it was most difficult to get through, was not Canada or Mexico, for all of our anti-Yankee sensibilities. It was most difficult to get it through the United States. Uh, politicians in both countries, fearing that Reagan would impose capital controls as well as trade controls from the early 80s on, uh, were the great enthusiasts and promoters of NAFTA originally. Uh, American manufacturing workers already experiencing the restructuring of manufacturing through the 1980s in the context of globalization as American multinationals went searching for cheap labor around the world. Uh, you could see the discomfort and the fear in Michigan, uh, in Ohio, in Pennsylvania, uh, in Illinois, uh, uh, in the run-up to uh, NAFTA. And, and a great many people thought that Clinton betrayed them in carrying it through. What Trump finally picked up, especially in the Midwest, uh, was that anti-NAFTA sensibility. Uh, that was the determining factor in him getting elected. As Mike Davis has shown in his remarkable, only Mike does this kind of work, in his remarkable essay in Catalyst, uh, he actually went and looked at the local newspapers in Midwest counties. Midwest counties that had voted Democrat without fail since the New Deal, had voted Obama. And he showed that plants were clo being closed during the course of the summer of 2016. Now, that never made the national news. But boy, it was the only item on local radio stations and whatever was left of local newspapers in those counties. The Democrats were already so weak as a political force in this respect. That, you know, in the old days, if a plant was going to be closed in a run-up to an American election, the Democrats would have enough influence to say, please, go ahead and close it in December. Just don't close it before November. Don't close it before the first Tuesday of November. They couldn't prevent this. And this was crucial to Trump's final election, although the contradiction was, of course, there all along. Obama was able to take advantage in 2008 of the 3 million jobs that had been lost in American manufacturing between 2001 and 2007. An additional 2.5 million were lost during the crisis between 2008 and 2010. It's 5.5 million manufacturing jobs. 
the recovery from 2010, 11 on was real. But only a million jobs went back to manufacturing in that period. Uh, so the Republicans and Trump were able to take advantage of what Obama took advantage of in those very counties in 2016. I think the serious question that we need to ask is what effects, what long-term effects, will this Trump administration have on the American state's central role and continuing central role in the managing of global capitalism? Uh, above all, in the containment of the volatility and the financial crises it inevitably gives rise to. One needs to stress in this respect that the political crisis that this represents is not a product of U.S. economic decline. It's not to say, and I'll come back to this, that one doesn't feel living in the United States, that the quality of life is declining. But that's not the same thing as the decline of U.S. capitalism in terms of its centrality in global capitalism. You could end up living in this country in a society looking like Blade Runner. And that wouldn't necessarily mean that the American state wasn't central to the making of global capitalism. Uh, it might precisely mean that there wouldn't be much political space left for the left, for trade unions, etc. The reason that the election of Trump is such a crisis for global capitalism is precisely because the American economy remains so central to global capitalism, not because of its decline. Just some indicators of the quote-unquote health of U.S. capitalism coming out of this great crisis that began here. First of all, uh, and perhaps most importantly, until the election of Trump, the American state played an absolutely central role in the containment of that crisis. The reason it didn't turn into the Great Depression, became the Great Recession, was very much because of the role of the Federal Reserve and the Treasury uh, in getting other states to immediately adhere to a communique written by the American Treasury in October uh, 2008, when still President Bush brought the leaders of the G20 states to Washington. First time the G20 had been going since the Asian crisis of 1997-98, but it was finance ministers that met to attempt to contain the volatility of finance. Uh, Bush brought the heads of state to Washington in uh, the fall of 2008. And they all committed not to allow what had happened in the Depression to happen again. They signed a communique written by the American Treasury that they would not introduce tariff barriers, that they would not introduce capital controls. And at every G20 meeting from then on, including up to this day, although the American Treasury under Trump is no longer writing the communiques, uh, they recommitted themselves to this. So the temptation to interrupt global capitalism in the face of what was experienced in, by way of massive uh, unemployment growth and decline in GNP uh, in 2008-2009 was held back under American leadership. Plus, uh, what Jimmy Carter couldn't do in 1977-78-79, uh, the American state was able to do in 2008-2009-2010, and that is to oversee a coordinated fiscal stimulus the largest stimulus, fiscal deficit, fiscal expenditure in American peacetime history. Even larger in China, of course, which was crucial to pulling out of what has become known as the Great Recession, but in 2009 looked like a repeat of the Great Depression. The massive fall off in world trade. That's the first crucial role that indicates the importance of American capitalism in global capitalism. But beyond that, 
American multinationals, or multinationals generally, let's begin with that, employed 50 million foreign workers, multinationals generally, employed 50 million workers in 2007. By 2016, they employed 82 million workers, a growth of 66%. So all the talk of deglobalization, which was so common on the left, hasn't taken place. If you look at US MNCs, they dominate almost every dynamic capitalist sector. Aerospace, computers, telecommunications, pharmaceuticals, health sciences, despite the backwardness of your uh, health care system, right? Uh, uh, in fact, Christoph uh, Herman, who's sitting here from Berkeley, did an essay in the register that showed the extent to which the German public health system was increasingly being run by American health management companies. This was 10 years ago, I think, Christoph. Um, U.S. profits recovered very quickly. This has not been a profitability crisis. Uh, by 2012, profits were already back to their average over the previous three decades, and since then, they have gone as, as, uh, by measuring it as after-tax profits or by percentage of GNP to their highest level since the mid-1960s. Now, it's very much been the case, of course, that there hasn't been an a investment boom accompanying this profit boom. And that's one of the reasons why rates of growth have been relatively low. Right? And even though there's been a return to something near full employment, levels of unemployment now uh, are at levels not seen even in the great boom of the 1950s, below 4%. Right? But uh, a great many American workers are not in the labor force, have not returned to being, or to being looking for jobs. They are discouraged workers, in other words. Right? And of course, as we know, so many of them are precarious workers, working two, three jobs, etc. Wage growth, therefore, has been minimal right, in this recovery. In that sense, one can speak of American decline. Uh, and you often see headlines of that kind that after you've read the headline, you read the article on how shitty life is becoming in this country, almost end with the United States remains the most powerful country in the world. Right? Although the headline would imply, as Trump does, that uh, this decline is a decline in its status or role or centrality in global capitalism. This decline at home, if you like, in terms of the quality of life is, of course, a source of central contradictions inside the United States. And those contradictions have effects in terms of America playing its global role. And you see this, above all, with Trump. The political crisis of empire that the Trump regime represents lies above all in what the long-term effects of the Trump administration will have on American state capacities to manage and superintend global capitalism. You've already seen in the case of the G7 and the G20 that the American Treasury no longer plays the central coordinating role. They go to these meetings unprepared. They say we will not sign communiques that the others now try to write, which will undermine the American national interest. They treat those meetings as attempts to recalibrate the degree of responsibility, cost, burden that other states have to bear in firefighting global crises. Reagan did that to some extent, too, above all with the Japanese. Uh, and it's not impossible that out of this kind of behavior, uh, you will see a recalibration to some extent, uh, not only in the economic arena, but also in the military strategic arena, where some of the NATO states may take on a larger portion of, expend of military expenditure. 
It's not impossible. And it's not impossible that, you know, in terms of the uh, configuration of concessions, that since 1948 with the Marshall Plan, the Americans did give to other states in order to integrate them into the informal empire. Uh, you will see some of that rebalanced out of uh, this hard bargaining. So, you know, uh, Japan and North Korea and initially Western Europe did benefit from an exchange rate being set under Bretton Woods when you had fixed exchange rates that were extremely favorable to exports from Japan, from South Korea, from Europe originally. And that was recalibrated through the course of the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, and that may occur again with uh, the tariff policy. Uh, the image that is most, I think, uh, rich in this respect is a picture of Angela Merkel uh, standing over a seated Trump who's sitting like this with a smirk on his face. And she is, she's leaning over him at a table like this, surrounded by officials from the other G7 countries at the Quebec City G7 meeting of June 2017, 2018, I think. And a Toronto Star journalist heard from uh, one of the officials standing around her, of course, not revealing who that was, that she was saying to him, how dare you do this to us after you pulled us into this global capitalism and now you are unilaterally pulling the, the, plug, the, the rug out from under us. Right. But this has been repeated at every G7, G20 meeting, including the most recent ones in Argentina where the United States actually hasn't signed some of the communiques. Precisely what it was doing uh, as they recommit themselves to keeping globalization going. Right? The United States doesn't sign this now. The Chinese present themselves right, as those most committed to keeping globalization going and berate the Trump administration for not maintaining its global responsibilities in this respect. That's what you hear from Xi. That's at the level of coordination, which is not unimportant. But much, much more important is the state capacities. Uh, the central thesis of Gintons in my book on the making of global capitalism was that the most crucial state institutions in the American formal empire are not the Pentagon, are not the CIA, uh, but are the Treasury and the Federal Reserve. And uh, everyone, I think, knows well that the State Department has not been restaffed under the Trump administration. Uh, that the Commerce Department are run by yahoos like Wilbur Ross, you know, who was uh, uh, one of those shysters who used to buy steel companies uh, as they were uh, in difficulty and then flipped them uh, in the 19... 80s. That's how he made his fortune. He now has the unmitigated gall after Trump introduced the steel tariffs and prices started rising in domestic steel to say that uh, this was because of hoarding taking place in the steel market by unscrupulous American businessmen who were engaging in antisocial behavior. This is Wilbur Ross. You couldn't find the more antisocial capitalists. But the greatest problem lies in the Treasury, which has played the central role in the management of global capitalism and the containment of its crises. Self-defining itself as a firefighter through those 92 financial crises when states removed capital controls in the 80s and 90s. Uh, Politico just showed, and this is the most recent news, uh, a very interesting article in Politico showed that uh, the Treasury is now running on a staff shortage of 8.3%. The uh, International Department of the Treasury, which is the most crucial in this respect, uh, once the guy who's now head of the International goes to the World Bank, will not have a single, a single Senate-approved senior figure. 
Part of this has to do with the lackadaisical nature of the White House in making nominations at that level to the Senate. Part of it has to do with an interest in deregulation. Uh, and, and one of the agencies that the Treasury runs, which is an interdepartmental, interdepartmental uh, financial uh, stability agency, which brings together the Fed the, and a number of other uh, agencies, which I won't go into, the, uh, uh, it, its budget was cut by half uh, by the summer of 2017, including simply its data gathering budget, without which there's not much you can do. Uh, both the Treasury and the Fed, uh, from the summer of 2017 on, uh, did most of the authoring of the deregulation of Dodd-Frank that was then passed through the Republican Senate and Congress. Uh, this was coordinated with them during that period, and it was designed to take some of the much greater supervision that was introduced in the banking system uh, for systemically important financial institutions from the 2008 crisis on, off their backs. Uh, not only the Volcker rules, but a bunch of others. Uh, so both in terms of the ability to predict crises and in terms of the capacity to contain them when they happen, there's a very large question now of whether the Treasury has either the interest or the capacity to do this. Now, you could say if he's defeated in 2020, that'll be it, you know, that it will be over and, and that capacity will rebuild, perhaps. But perhaps this is reflecting something deeper and more long-standing. Ironically, ironically, it's been the Federal Reserve which has been most independent and least touched by this deterioration in state capacity under the Trump administration. I say ironically because the left often sees independent central banking as a prophylactic against democratic progressive pressures. Why do banks proclaim their independence? They mean they're independent from democratic pressures, because they put it as from elected governments. Right? Uh, the irony of independent central banking is that it's able to proclaim some independence and retain some autonomy from these right-wing scoundrels when they get elected. And that's also been the case with Trump. And that's very surprising because Trump has actually appointed six of the seven most important people on the Fed board. Uh, you know, people look at the, the Supreme Court and his appointments. Uh, but he's actually had the uh, opportunity to appoint, appoint six of the most seven Fed positions, the most important seven, including, of course, the chair of the Fed, Powell. Now, one has to say that although the people he's appointed are no socialists, uh, they, you know, they have retained their sense of the central role they play in the maintenance of global capitalism, in the supervision of financial volatility. And I don't think, for instance, that Trump's fulminations against their raising interest rates which they were doing uh, uh, over the, and Yellen began and Powell continued uh, because they thought the economies were overheating. Um, their decision to draw back from that and not be raising interest rates this year uh, had virtually nothing to do with Trump's displeasure with that. Uh, it was entirely internal calibrations uh, in terms of the downturn above all in the European economies and the continuing weaknesses of the European banks, which the Fed has been central. I mean, insofar as there was quantitative easing in this country through the crisis, it was continued long after American banks were out of trouble. Uh, it was continued mainly so those banks would continue their overnight banking lending to European banks who would have gone under otherwise. Now, 
I think this is what we have to look at in terms of, uh, I'll just finish with this, in, in terms of the implications of the Trump administration. Obviously, a regime like this does a great deal to tarnish American ideological hegemony. But globalization has never primarily been about because you guys are seen as such wonderful people in the world. Uh, you know, I, when Perry Anderson said neoliberalism, he said it back in, I think, 99, was uh, the most successful ideology in world history. I thought then that was wrong. That was the year of Seattle. Right? Uh, it, its political expression was very weak, largely because it took the form of protest. People standing with signs outside of the World Bank uh, rather than trying to get in, you know, walking. Indeed, I remember the Washington demonstration after Seattle, after the uh, Teamsters and Turtles one. There was one in, uh, uh, in April uh, of 2000 where everybody marched past the Treasury to block traffic in front of the World Bank building, as though that was the center of world power. Uh, but that, I'm making this point because ideology hasn't been, it wasn't that neoliberal globalization was ever ideologically all that attractive to people. Right? But it does have an ideologically tarnishing effect, uh, no question, on the American empire, especially insofar as it makes people like Merkel's life more difficult and open space to neo-fascists and xenophobes. Uh, in many ways, Lula was the best friend of American globalization in Brazil, right? Fostering the interests of Brazilian multinationals, right? Paving their way to invest in the United States as well as in Africa, right? Uh, so the contradictions of this, of course, even though you get someone like Bolsonaro, uh, who uh, is in many ways a xenophobic neo-fascist, Right? and who commits himself to the American empire, uh, his ability to play the kind of role, uh, especially insofar as he's targeting the role of the uh, state investment bank in Brazil, who played such a crucial role in sponsoring Brazilian capitalism abroad, will probably blow up in their faces. Right? Insofar as this is overlaid by the migration and refugee crisis, which is an element of global capitalism, obviously, although it's obviously a part of the unnecessary mess that the American state has made of the Middle East. Uh, uh, this contributes to uh, the contradictions that the Trump administration plays in the world. Uh, it foments the role that Trump plays uh, uh, with his appalling xenophobia and racism vis-a-vis -vis Central Americans and Mexicans, foments, of course, uh, that xenophobia around the world. Uh, and it makes it extremely difficult to manage this migration crisis without other xenophobes coming to power. And there is a danger that these nationalisms will collide. What holds them back is the degree of integration of their capitalist classes in global capitalism. The role that uh, German industrial capital played in finally supporting Hitler when the main alternative was the communists and the fascists, the Nazis, right, is much more difficult for German capital to play now. And that's true around the world in terms of these xenophobes because of the degree of integration of dynamic capitalisms. Uh, they no longer are investing in their own social formation alone. They are investing in their social formation, but their accumulation strategies are indeed regional, if not global. Uh, and therefore, there is a constraint and limit on how far these xenophobes can go. It's always been the case, on the other hand, that China and Russia would be much harder to integrate uh, into global capitalism by the American state than were Europe and Japan for one essential reason and that is the United States were not in the United States was not involved in the reconstruction of China and Russia after the devastation of World War II. The Japanese and the Western European states above all the German states were reconstructed as states 
under American hegemony. Right. So it isn't just a matter that they were once communist. Right. It has very much to do with that very different historical trajectory. Nothing is irreversible. Uh, nothing is unstoppable. Uh, those people who were the theorists of globalization and presented global capitalism as an unstoppable force that all social democratic parties, labor parties, trade unions had to get on to. They had to get on to this because it couldn't be stopped. This was always absurd. It was always contingent on what states did. And it is possible that uh, we will see in the 21st century global capitalism break down. I'm not predicting that, however. Uh, the forces of the working class, the forces of the left, uh, uh, the forces of a socialist alternative, which would have to take place through individual states, even if it was internationalist, right, are very weak. It was obviously seen in the one state where a socialist government was elected in the wake of this crisis in Greece. Right. You'll see it again if Jeremy Corbyn gets, who I am a friend of and have known since the 1970s and admire enormously, if he becomes Prime Minister of Britain. You will see the enormous constraints on what he, a very committed socialist, will be able to do. Right. All one can hope for is that these political scoundrels don't close the political space that allow for progressive, critical forces against capitalist globalization, democratic socialist ones above all, to be nurtured and grow. If they get lucky enough to get elected anywhere, let's say it's Bernie Sanders in 2020 as of this week's news, I don't think they'll be able to do much. Uh, but what we need above all is the time to nurture those types of forces. It's a remarkable thing for a Canadian to be looking south and you guys are no longer looking to us, uh, thinking that we're your Sweden. Right? Uh, you know, that's a pleasure to see for a change. Um, the New York Times had another poll up today that showed that uh, over 50% of American Democratic voters uh, prefer socialism to capitalism. It's a remark, whatever the hell that means. They think that means. <laughs> um, so I, I think in terms of what we need to look for out of this Trump regime uh, and all of the xenophobic regimes, above all, is whether they close political space. Uh, uh, of course, socialists need to be internationalists. But what internationalism means above all in this context is to try to keep national democratic political space open. I'll end with that. Thanks. Thanks for your, your talk. I, I think that the uh, question of what's happening with US, U.S. imperialism is an important one because um, no imperial empire lasts forever. Um, there's a decline of, of all imperialist empires. And I think what's uh, uh, true in the United States is that the, although the military remains the most formidable military in the world, uh, the United States is faced with competitors, global capitalist competitors. And that is creating, which the United States helped develop. I mean, the investment of American capital into China led to the ability of China to become a a world competitor and develop their economy in 20 years, 30 years. So I think that our, the question of imperialism is central, and I, I don't believe that you don't have inter-imperialist rivalry. That in, despite the fact that you have global capitalism does not mean you don't have imperialist, inter-imperialist rivalries, nation states fighting each other. And the, I think the invasion uh, of Iraq, like the invasion of Vietnam, helped escalate the decline of U.S. capitalism, uh, with the separation of gold to the dollar, uh, that was an example of that. So, uh, and I think that the the rise of Trump is a reflection of the decline of U.S. capitalism, and the fact that the real living standards of the working class have declined, and workers and people see 
they're looking for another system. They're looking for uh, somebody who will solve their basic economic crisis, their decline, and the fact that they have no future. Now, the, I agree with you. I think that there is a rise in the United States of social democracy. And Bernie Sanders could be the next president of the United States. And I agree with you that he can't really change fundamentally capitalism. But I think that the rise of social democracy in the United States, the fact that young people see socialism as a solution for their future, is a big development. It hasn't happened in my lifetime. It hasn't happened I, in a long, I think in the history of the United States, there's never been a time where the young people felt that they wanted socialism. And that is, uh, I think, uh, extending the crisis in the capitalist class. I mean, the, the right wing is flipping out if you go to Fox now. The communists have taken over, you know, I mean, it, it's, uh, and so what does that mean? I, I think that it means that there, there is a growth of socialism and Marxism, and that the working class in the United States is not going to put up with the continued decline in their living standards. And we see now a wave of strikes, the teachers, uh, the hotel workers, there's a rising movement of the working class, and that combined with the political development of young people looking to socialism could lead to a, a working class development. And I think that that is quite possible. But the, I, I see the danger, though, is that every imperialist empire, when it is in decline, it becomes more and more adventurous. And that's an example, I think, of Trump, you know, to attack Venezuela, to uh, have a confrontational policy with other capitalist countries. And I think that that's going to expand. There is no solution. Uh, to the crisis of American capitalism, the world capitalism. And the other thing, the last point I want to make is that how did the United States finance getting out of 20, 2008? It financed it by printing money um, and uh, to the banks and transferring the wealth to the bank. And then the banks took over homes and, and other things. The situation of another collapse in the face of deregulation, massive deregulation and privatization, means that the ability of American capitalism in another collapse, major collapse, is going to be even more difficult. And that is a problem for American capitalism and world capitalism, which I don't think they have a solution for, leading to the possibility of a real imperialist war, which is a real danger that I see. So. Um, there are many ways that also imperialism establishes uh, its dominion internationally and also within competition between, uh, in, you know, if we, we want to call it, I do call it imperial states, and uh, those are the production of commodities. As for example, uh, you know, uh, the United States uh, auto makers are not in the same situation that they were 10 years ago. I mean, if we look at the economic indicators, as for example, no longer, you know, uh, the American uh, hegemony, in auto making is so predominant, like now. I mean, Toyota is a big competitor, Volkswagen, and so on. And if we look at the banking system, uh, also, you know, we see Chinese banks, uh, uh, you know, right in there. And uh, American banks are among the first 10 banks are, you know, the, now there are only like two between, within the first uh, 10. Although you're right that in, a, in management assets, the United States remain undisputed, you know, administrating uh, insurance and all these things. Um, and definitely, as for example, you mentioned the case of Brazil. Brazil's uh, main uh, imp uh, imp importer is China, and the main exporter to Brazil is China, which is, uh, you know, a competition, and such as... Uh, influence that we would have not seen, uh, we didn't see that 25 years ago or 10 years ago. I mean, uh, it, it, it is incredible right here in the backyard of the United States. And, uh, you know, there are places in Latin America that, as for example, uh, utilities uh, are, you know, mainly uh, European and so on. So definitely it's a competition right there. It does not mean that obviously the American uh, empire is weak and beaten back and against the corner, but certainly, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a loss of influence. Uh, and uh, it's not so easy, for example, uh, for the Americans to do uh, as they please, as uh, they, economically as they were, you know, if it was uh, probably like 30 or 40, 50 years ago. Uh, in terms of, for example, uh, 
we saw that in the in, in the Libyan campaign that most of the you know energy resources in, in, in Libya were Europeans. I mean, uh, Total and uh, other you know uh, companies, French, uh, German, and the U.S. obviously was uh, an important investor there, but you know. Uh, definitely faced, particularly in Africa today, facing with a lot of European competition. That's why, as for example, the French imperialists, uh, they invaded uh, a, you know, a, a number of uh, French uh, former colonies in order to uh, establish its dominion and stability in terms of their investments in mining and uh, water and other resources. Uh, and I agree with you certainly that uh, a neoliberalism has actually uh, established a dominion of the state in terms of guaranteeing b b profits for the corporations. As for example, uh, when the U.S. Uh, invades a country, it does at the behest and at the benefit of some economic interests. And uh, certainly, I do agree with you that uh, precisely uh, neoliberalism is a guarantee. You know, is used by the. Uh, I get, I get and this is going to be a quick one. Uh, I wanted to ask you know, to go back to the socialist strategy. And uh, you're, of course, skeptical of socialism in one country, and we all know why. Uh, but I am actually curious about what do you think about, I came back from one of the recent social forums, and Samir Amin's take on uh, delinking is enjoying a new sort, new kind of popularity. And I don't remember ever reading you writing about this. So I'm curious, what do you think about that proposal, maybe in some new refashioned version? Uh, and if not that, what kind of socialist project do you see as actually viable? Do we have one more, or is this enough for now? I can take um, I talked a long time, so it's your turn. Uh, just, yeah, I have a really quick couple of questions. Just about, I really enjoyed the talk. Um, one is your comment about about Bolsonaro in Brazil. Do you really think, and could you explain more about how you think it's going to blow up in his face the way he's taking on their economy? And also, um, you talked about <coughs> the uh, recovery, so to speak, after the 2008-2009 kind of recession. Um, would you fully call it a recovery or something more on paper? Or sometimes, I mean, was it a recovery everywhere or here in our little coastal elite or just certain parts of the economy that are even more geographically disparate than in previous times? Is it really a recovery or not? But these are great questions. Um, well, obviously, uh, when I hear the word, I don't use the word imperialism nearly as much as most critics of uh, capitalism. Uh, I refer to the American Empire. I think the United States has uh, been internationalized as a state, that is, uh, for reasons that need to be very carefully examined through the course of the 20th century. Its state came to take responsibility for the making and reproduction of global capitalism around the world. Now, for a considerable period, of course, large chunks of the world were closed to capital accumulation entirely. Uh, China and uh, the Soviet empires uh, regions. Uh, I understand one can still speak of imperialism in the sense that it's been a very important motivating concept for the left and, and indeed for uh, nationalist forces uh, and, and a very useful one in the sense of Yankee imperialism. I'm a Canadian, after all, of a generation that tried to portray ourselves as as much the victims of the American Empire as Latin Americans, which is absurd. Uh, but uh, uh, I understand the value of the term. But I, I, I disagree uh, with the fundamental premise uh, that we understand today's world in the form of national capitals, dominant national capitals, controlling their states and competing with one another through the use of state power to disadvantage the, another state. If anything, I think this is a mirror image of the Trump mentality. 
of the Reaganite mentality, which Reagan, you know, and uh, you know, quickly was socialized into not uh, practicing. Uh, and I, I simply think it's a mistaken analysis, and you know we can go through it. But um, uh, a reference was made to the Iraq War reflecting something to do with the American dollar. Eighty-eight percent of transactions in the exchange markets today are in the American dollar. Four percent is the renminbi. The euro, which was supposed to replace the dollar, is off the chart as a global currency. Uh, some people on the left interpreted the invasion of Iraq in terms of Saddam saying that he wouldn't sell his oil in dollars. So fucking what? Pardon the expression. That is transferred in a nanosecond into dollars. There's, there is no, nothing prevents the translation of euros into dollars in a nanosecond. It doesn't matter. Saddam may thought it would matter. Right? Um, of course, China has become a, a remarkable capital, the great late capitalist developer in world history. No question. It's a remarkable development. The fact that it's taking place under the leadership of a venal communist set of families <laughs> is bizarre, <laughs> but nevertheless, history is full of surprises. Right? And, and moreover, like most of the communist regimes that we saw in the 20th century, they are nationalists, primarily. That's why they became communists. Right? Uh, that said, they are the late capitalist developer with the most foreign direct investment in history, by far. Right? Yes, Brazil, of course, uh, China became its main market as it turned its agricultural system into an exporter of a few uh, uh, agricultural exports, above all soy. Right? Instead of a balanced agriculture to feed over 200 million Brazilian people, you now have the production of soy to sell it to China. What is it doing? It's feeding Chinese workers who are dependent on selling to Europe and the United States, and above all the United States. That chain is another way of tying Brazil to the United States. The notion that the BRICS, Britain, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, were going to become an alternate pole of accumulation is hilarious now. Right? And when people speak of China as an Asian power, what does that mean? I mean, Japan and India and Vietnam are inviting the United States to play a military role there because they fear China. No, you're right, they partly fear it because of a history of Chinese imperialism of a pre-capitalist kind in that region. Uh, but it is you know, far more difficult for China, despite its Belt and Road Initiative, to dominate Asia than it was for the United States. If anything, I would argue that the degree of military integration and security and intelligence integration is a problem because it's much less than the economic integration. And a large portion of the uh, American state spends its time and its anxiety looking at the extent to which it doesn't have control over the Chinese and indeed even the Russian military and security apparatus. That's true. That's what they're paid to do. But as you said, you look at the you know, balance of, of forces here. And it, right. Now, if you're saying, you know, at some point in the course of the 21st century, this Chinese venal capitalist class, which is nationalist and does have a great sense of national pride, right, is able to hold the Chinese state together which is still a question, right? It could conceivably turn into what Germany was to Britain before World War I. That's conceivable. But to see the dynamics of what's going on in the world today in these terms now just seems to me wrong. Now, we are seeing the old Yankee imperialism in Venezuela. Of course, right? They don't want socialist governments in their backyard. It looks bad. There are pressures from the Venezuelan bourgeoisie in Miami and all of Florida, right? 
That's where they spend their weekends if they haven't already moved there. Mm -hmm. right? They always have. Right? The fact that, as they put it, I heard them say it, a mestizo, Chavez, was governing Venezuela, right? was part of the problem. Right? This is old Yankee imperialism, but this is not really very central. Right? Venezuela is, you know, problem it posed in terms of being, having the largest oil reserves was nothing to the American economy. On the contrary, what you see is Venezuela's dependence uh, on the American market. Right. Uh, and, and to a large extent, even when they took oil fields away from the American, and not only the American, uh, oil companies, their dependence on the technical expertise of those engineers of the international oil companies. Because it, it is a problem. It was before the commodity crisis uh, that the Venezuelan oil company was in trouble, and partly because it was signing contracts, partly with the Chinese, which it wasn't able to fulfill because it couldn't get that oil out without the technical expertise. So, I don't deny there are elements of the old Yankee imperialism. But it's hard to paint Trump quite that way because he's also got elements of isolationism in him. So how do you read the North Korea thing? How do you read the fact that I turn on uh, uh, NBC or, or CBS um, and, and I see black women supporters of Sanders attacking Trump by defending the FBI and CIA. <laughs> That's going to be some of the contradictions of American social democracy because they are investing their energies uh, and, and, and their legitimacy in the protection of this capitalist American state, including even its military and security apparatus. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, we can go on arguing about this, I will the rest of my life, arguing with, you know, Marxists who define themselves in terms of interimperial rivalry, or, you know, the next crisis will be the big one. Um, uh, and, and I don't think it will be. Uh, you know, this has been an incredibly, unfortunately, resilient system, which Marx thought in 1858 was coming to an end. I think he didn't finish Volumes 2 and 3 in Capital because he began realizing it wasn't, uh, and was trying to work that out, you know, the dynamism of that system. Uh, it is a crisis-ridden system. It's increasingly irrational. Tragically, the form its crises take are less the product of working class strength because of the defeat of trade unionism. But whoever said, quite rightly, uh, you know, we are seeing some revival by virtue of a redefinition of what is the working class. You know, you know, it, it, we are seeing class formation going on in front of our eyes with teachers who traditionally, of course, were you know, the central pillars of middle class respectability. Right? And insofar as you have a definition of fascism as coming from the petty bourgeoisie, it was civil servants and teachers that were its backbone. So the fact that this is taking place, that there's a, a class reformation taking place, with teachers in the lead and being on the left in that respect is very hopeful. I, I, I entirely agree with that. Um, but, you know, this is taking us in different directions. Okay. Um, I think the socialism in one country thing is a very interesting question, and, and as if you mean it as a strategy, presumably, yes. because as a empirical fact, it's not taking place. Uh, there's a phenomenal piece in this year's Register uh, by Jayati Ghosh, the uh, Indian economist uh, in Delhi, and it, it's an essay on is Asia delinking. And it's not. It's simply not delinking from global capitalism or the you know, American empire insofar as the state oversees global capitalism. It's not. And the expectation that you would see delinking out of this crisis, it hasn't happened. Right? Um, that said, it's hard to imagine a socialist strategy that doesn't involve somehow delinking from <laughs> global capital accumulation. Yes. It's hard to imagine that. On the other hand, it's hard to imagine any state being able to do so, apart 
perhaps from this one. Um, uh, so at a minimum, you would need to have, I think the type of social inter socialist internationalism has to involve encouraging the development of social forces inside each state, right. trying to have a politics that leaves as much space as possible for that to happen within each state, but with an awareness that you're not going to get very far reintroducing capital controls unless you have cooperative capital controls, i.e. when capital escapes your country, that the country is going to has an international obligation signed in a treaty that it will not permit that movement. Right? This is what was introduced or advanced by D Harry Dexter White during the Second World War. He was more radical than Keynes and he was with the Treasury. And that's what Wall Street prevented was cooperative capital controls uh, in, in the Bretton Woods Agreement of 1944. But I agree, that would have to be, that should be the strategy. I, I entirely agree. I think Samir Amin, who was, a, I mean, he just tragically died, was, you know, one of the great, I think, Marxist third world intellectuals of his time. I think he was always too optimistic about the extent to which the third world would replace the proletariat as the agency of socialist transformation. Uh, and you know, Monthly Review has represented that position in the United States and so on. And it clearly was too optimistic. You know, so many third world socialists ended up being capitalist dictators in Africa or in Latin America, etc. cetera. Um, uh, but apart from that, even those that didn't found it extremely difficult to delink, right? Um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure what else to pick up. The recovery, I think, has been real in capitalist terms. Uh, profits really did recover uh, and are very significantly high. Investment has not recovered um, uh, to an extent proportional to those profits at all. Uh, and that does mean that the economy is more vulnerable. I think that that's true. Uh, you know, uh, you're right that I think one does, does need to look at the regional location of employment. And there's no question that rural America, which is one of the roots, especially in the Midwest, in those counties, which lost the one plant in their county, which kept employment going, uh, you know, has been one of the sources of Trump's xenophobic appeal, or xenophobic appeals in general. I think one does have to look at that carefully, you're right. Um, but I think the recovery in capitalist terms is undeniable. Not at, you know, post-war rates of growth levels, but post-war rates of growth levels were entirely exceptional over the last two centuries. You know, capitalism's emergence and dynamism and spread did not take place at the rates of growth you saw in the 1950s. They took place at the rates of growth we're seeing now. Um, as for Bolsonaro, who knows? I mean, I, I really, uh, the que I think that, that the BNDS in Brazil, the State Investment Bank, has been crucial to the development of a dynamic Brazilian capitalist class, which, uh, of, you know, for instance, Vale, uh, the largest nickel producer in the world now is an example, it's taken over the Canadian nickel industry, et cetera, it's just experienced this appalling uh, a tragedy of a dam collapsing and all those hundreds of people being killed and so on. Um, I, I think the corruption that was there in the State Investment Bank with these multinationals was functional to Brazilian capitalism. I'm sure the corruption isn't going to go away, it'll appear in new forms, but it may appear in more dysfunctional forms for Brazilian capital than the State Investment Bank played for them, which underwrote a lot of their accumulation and opened a lot of space for them in terms of transnational investment and so on. But that's what I was thinking of when I, I was saying that. I don't know enough about Brazil to say much more than that. Uh, just a quick question about the uh, investments. Why isn't the investments growing? You know, profits have kind of yeah. turned, but investments haven't. That's, that's a very good question. I mean, just a fast answer. That you know, this is this is the sixty-four dollar question. Um, 
and you know, uh, mainstream Marxist economists, if one could use this term, <laughs> uh, are looking for evidence of uh, the tendency of the rate of profit to fall expla explaining this. Uh, I don't think that's a concept that holds much water. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it is hard to explain. I, I think what has to be, I, I don't think uh, that there's any evidence that there's a tendency of the rate of profit to fall explaining it. Uh, but it is hard to explain. It partly has to do with so many arenas of accumulation now not requiring a great deal of fixed investment. So, uh, you know, whoever was mentioning the auto industry as one of their examples, Toyota, I mean, Toyota is already displacing American markets in the late 1960s. This is hardly anything new. But in computers, in telecommunications, in pharmaceuticals, in the health sciences, there is much less fixed capital required than an auto plant, right? So uh, that is one of the reasons why you're seeing uh, a, a, a smaller proportion of GDP showing up as investment, right? When you're creating commodities out of software, right? When indeed you're creating commodities out of financial instruments, right? It doesn't show up as capital fixed investment. That's, that's a factor. I think that there's more than that going on. I mean, I do think that there is a strong sense of vulnerability, of an awareness of how volatile international finance is. Uh, and, you know, I think a lot of these bastards are uh, consuming their enormous wealth, right? Um, and uh, salting it away uh, or simply consuming it in, you know, what Veblen would not have conceived as a form of ruling caste consumption. Um, so, you know, I, I, I think that is happening too, but I don't have a, I don't think anybody has a good answer for this, but it's clear uh, that, that despite the enormous increase in, or recovery in profits, there has not been the same recovery investment. The trend becomes apparent long before 2008 you can see a relative decline in, in, in capital investment from 2001 on in the United States. So it predates the 2007-8 crisis, which leads Sam and I to think that there's a deeper structural reason having to do with what are the dynamic sectors of the economy and how much capital investment they require. But, you know, I think it, it is, I mean, this is very tentative. I, Hold you to it. Fantastic talk. Um, you, you mentioned earlier about you know, synchronized growth and how long it took for that to occur, but it made me think about um, the lack of synchronized resistance, if you like, the kind of from below question, right? That, right. that is, as you mentioned, you know, Seattle, you, you know, you had a very major globalization movement, anti-globalization movement, which really, I think, redefined the terms. It, as you mentioned, there was not been working class resistance that's been a part of this current crisis. But there have been other movements that may have been, and I think the environmental crisis in general is part of this as well. But just that lag time between the globalization or anti-globalization movement and then the right-wing populism, which is picking up some of the same arguments against globalization, but as far as the media is concerned, it's acting as if that other movement never happened. right? So all those critiques coming from the left around the same things, which were precisely anti-nationalist, anti-xenophobic, Right, thanks to I think it's relatively successful historical erasure, we're sort of like, well, here's the critique of globalization. But again, in, just thinking in terms of, of, of synchronization or, or lack thereof, you know, around the kinds of resistance, you know, in the world, and and also of course the fact that this movement did happen and it did cause at the very least, you know, the leaders to stop having these big summits and it, you know caused I think a change in the rhetoric so that Perry Anderson would probably not say he was very successful anymore. Neoliberalism was indefensible. Um, and yet it lingered on as a zombie, you know, Tina, yep. sort of automaton, so, yeah. I think your, one of your key points was that um, the, really the threat of the, the right wing was the, the closing of the, like, the political space. And I just wanted, maybe if you could speak to, you know, the extent of 
you know, the fight for socialism being the fight to sort of maintain a democracy, and if you see, you know, what, what opportunities and contradictions that might uh, present to the yeah. movement. Um, yes, yeah, so I definitely agree with your assessment around um, some like Corbin or some type figure eventually seeing some political space. So my question is, what do you foresee um, a Corbin or some similar figure doing in that space? Uh, that's a very good point. That's a nice parallel. The lack of synchronized resistance um, and, and the great, well, there was a lot of synchronized resistance in the form of protest. You're absolutely right. At the turn of the millennium, um, from India, I mean, the the protests against neoliberalism by Indian peasants preceded Seattle. Um, and one of the reasons that Seattle focused on the WTO was because of the resistance of the Indian peasants in, in 1995. Uh, and you know, the World Social Forums was evidence of that. And you go to Brazil to Porto Alegre, and you see people from all over the world. Uh, you know, being energized and enervated, and not just in abstract, you know, ideological terms. People would come together and plan their struggles against water privatization transnationally in very concrete ways, you know, at, at those World Social Forums. There was tremendous naivete, as there usually are by protesters, you know, they'd go to Brazil and see that there were still favelas on garbage dumps, and say, how can this be in Porto Alegre? The Workers' Party has been government there since 1989. Can't be the case. Uh, you know, the, all of them were anti-party. Uh, but, you know, it was the Brazilian trade unions who were totally integrated with the Workers' Party Brazil that were funding the World Social Forums, right? Uh, and then as soon as Chavez started appearing, you know, everyone was cheering Chavez, even though they were you can't change the world without, you know, you can't change, how, how did it go? Change the world without taking power, right? Right? Uh, you have nothing to do with the state, etc. What happened after Occupy, in, in, which turned that resistance in class ways, it was very interesting. I mean, it was a very crude class map, 99 to 1. Uh, but at least it was a class map. Right? Uh, it was a really crude one, uh, but it was, it was a class map. And with the indignados in Spain and Syntagma in Greece, etc., uh, that was the high point of, I think, that protest, that synchronized protest stuff. And you got a shift, uh, which Sam and I call a shift from protest to politics, that took place in the wake of Occupy with all of those protests finally giving rise to new parties. Uh, a realization that you can protest till hell freezes over and you won't change the world, and the creation of Podemos, the explosion of Syriza from having been a marginal party outside of Athens, certainly, uh, into a national force, uh, and the emergence of Corbyn, uh, the very short bridge between Occupy and Sanders, really. Right, on the you know with support from those people who were anarchists in in Occupy, right. Um, so there was a certain synchronization, I think, with that. But in a deeper in a deeper sense, reflecting, I think, the weakness of that shift from protest to politics in class terms, because although it was class focused, it was very little class rooted. Was that when Syriza got elected in Greece. The Northern European labor movement gave it absolutely no support. You know, everybody admires the Swedish Social Democrats. Right? They were racist vis-a-vis -vis what they called the pigs, Portugal, Italy, Spain, and Greece. Right? Literally, you know, the Southern Europeans don't work. Don't work hard enough. They actually work longer hours than Northern Europeans do. Right? Uh, and really to talk to activists, to socialists, even to trade union leaders uh, uh, in Germany, for instance, who were sympathetic to Syriza, they said, we can't bring this up, you know, with our supporters. 
so the failure of the European labor movement uh, around Syriza was, you know, historic, absolutely historic. Um, it, you know, it, it, yeah, it is. It, yeah, I think it, it is a product of social democracy's uh, effect on the working class. Um, it wasn't, you know, it was partly a matter of, of course, social democracy buying into European austerity, definitely. But it was also the long-term effect on working class consciousness amongst people who were still voting social democrat, although the German great, you know, the greatest social democratic party in, in the 20th century, uh, in the late 19th century, now is getting, what, 20% of the vote. Unbelievable. Uh, so to pick up the Corbyn thing, uh, it's also unbelievable that the Labour Party is now the largest party in Europe. And it's the largest party in Europe because in the summer that Syriza was forced by the Europeans, including the European Social Democrats, to accept yet another round of austerity. Right? That that same summer, Corbyn luckily got 35 Labour MPs to nominate him to, to be uh, leader of the Labour Party. Uh, and this, you know, ignited a social movement with now 400,000 people having joined the Labour Party with 4,000 activists and momentum. Uh, now, that said, you know, it needs to be very careful. If you said to most of them, even most momentum activists, what do you mean by socialism? You know, you guys all laughed when I said whatever the hell that means. You know, you'd find the same thing. And there is not, given what social democracy has done to uh, British, you know, popular political education, which is non-existent, in other words. Uh, a, a radical strategy on the part of Corbyn uh, would not either be understood or supported by most of uh, the people who voted for him, I think. The degree of sacrifice that would be involved in cutting the city of London off from its role in international capitalism, which was what capital controls would entail, Right. And although many of the people around him are very good, I mean, the Shadow Chancellor of the Exchequer, MacDonald, is a sophisticated Marxist. Um, and, and there are others like him. You know, and when I said you can't possibly introduce capital controls to one of them because the cost of this, you're telling people you're going to finally get them out of years of austerity. You're going to introduce capital controls in the city and they'll have to take a much more massive hit in their standard of living. They'd have to be, in other words, be prepared to see that through. A redefinition of what the standard of living is, which we need for ecological reasons anyway. Right? Uh, that level of political education is not there. Uh, nor do I see all of the unions who are supporting Corbyn including Unite, one of the largest in the world, led by someone who would be happily call himself a Marxist. There's no political education going on in that union to speak of. Uh, so, you know, in terms of what Corbyn's strategy would be, I, I have a, a little book, a little black book that Gindan and I did called The Socialist Challenge Today, Series of Sanders Corbyn, that talks about that a little. And Colin Lees and I are now working on a third edition of the end of parliamentary socialism, which will take you to Corbyn. It's, it is a social democratic strategy. Uh, that's okay, as someone said. I mean, that, that's good, in fact. Uh, um, it, it's one that will entail the introduction of elements of industrial democracy in the industries they'll renationalize. There's a danger with that. It looks a bit like Elizabeth Warren. I don't know if people followed her Corporate Responsibility Act. You know, when she said, I'm a, I'm a capitalist to my bones. Reform, reform right? capitalist. I'm a reformed capitalist to my bones. Um, you know, it, it's German Mittbestimmung. It, it's German industrial democracy. It's not to say that it doesn't help build up the strength of trade unions, a sense of confidence amongst workers. It does. It can. And that can lead it to go further. But it also can be a basis you put you know, a third of company boards become worker representatives. And usually they ally with corporate management. 
adopting a competitive strategy against other corporations. Right? And that's a real danger that could happen with, uh, with Corbyn. Uh, but, it, you know, hopefully it won't. I mean, hopefully it'll be part of a process of political education and political development. Uh, you know, but, you know, you, one shouldn't be looking at this with starry eyes. Uh, there is a great danger of the social democratization of Corbyn, although he has spent his whole career being a critic of, you know, mainstream social democracy and its integration into capitalism. 